Hi, I'm Alex Pearl, and this is Beyond Borders, the show where we celebrate unique and creative minds within the LGBT community. Joining me today is Erica Scheimer. Erica is a writer, a director, a singer, a voice actress, and a significant force within the Filmation Studio family. She's brought to life some outstanding shows, including She-Ra, Brave Star, and He-Man. Erica, it's an honor to have you on the show. Thank you so much for joining me. Well, I would say the honor is all mine. Alex, it's my pleasure. Well, thank you. I'd like to start off by talking about the He-Man and She-Ra days here in L.A. I don't know if you recall, I was the guy that thanked you for helping bring my husband and I together. Yes, I do recall. And I feel very often. Honored, Alex. That's wonderful. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, you know, we both grew up on the show. We're both still big fans. Uh, what do you feel it is that keeps She-Ra going strong where so many other shows have come and gone? I think with both She-Ra and He-Man, I think one of the pivotal things that really hooked fans in and makes it still popular today, as silly as it might sound, I want to say the pro-social messages, the the underlying values of the show that made it really human and, and beyond just entertainment. And in my experience, in going to different conventions, Comic Con or Power Con, um, people always bring up to me the fact of how important those those morals, those values were, and how it made them excel in life and want to achieve more. It sounds weird because we got a lot of flack from networks or, you know, people who really weren't into it about really? the morals. But when I talk to them, really? yes, it's, it's, I mean, as a matter of fact, Alex, um, one of the reasons that my dad, Lou Scheimer, who was co-founder of Filmation, ended up devising this idea about first-run syndication in the afternoons for kids was because the networks were getting sick of his pro-social messages. And if they heard one more of those, they were going to kick him out. You know, that's, and, that's such um, a surprise. Because the, you it, know, it is that, and it's the fact that the pro-social messages were deeply woven into the fabric of the show that really makes it special. I agree. They, they weren't just tacked on at the end. Mm -hmm. It was a fundamental story point. As you said, they wove it throughout the fabric of the story and that really made it very potent for youngsters my dad started dealing with that you know your your listeners don't know but 1971 the surgeon generals had a surgeon general had a report on the state of kid shows and pretty much what they had had to say it was pretty deplor deplorable. Um, it was you know mostly violence and, and there wasn't really a lot of good things going on response to that, the network said, well, we've got to do something good. And, you know, coincidentally, that's, you know, when my dad uh, got involved with Fat Albert. And in terms of making that into a show and developing that uh, with, with meaningful messages, and that was integral. And he got um, a UCLA professor of education involved yes. in reading all this and, and everything. And, and that's how the networks started it um, with, with Fat Albert. The show did very well, even though they, they would preempt it and put it, you know, late in the afternoon. But it, it really worked in it and was on the air for, you know, almost 13 years. And that was such a formative experience for my dad that, that he wanted to integrate those messages in all the work that Filmation did, in as many possibilities as possible. So when it came time to start this first-run syndication with He-Man, Filmation was a very powerful force at that point. It was not going to be a half-an-hour commercial. My dad was really clear with Mattel about that. Good. And he also was... He cared so much about the audience he was serving that nothing was more important. And I mean making money wasn't as important as it was to make sure that he did good things for the kids. And it shows. So, it shows in the quality of the work and the way that he had done it. I agree. And I say it shows in our fans. I was recently at a PowerCon convention with 
sort of celebrates He-Man, She-Ra, Thundercats, Ninja Turtles, that, that 80s, that, that early to mid-80s mm-hmm. kind of thing. And I can't tell you, I mean, there was one kid, I, I think he was from Argentina, who was telling me, I became a lawyer because of watching He-Man and She-Ra. They m- made me want to get a good education and help defend the poor and the downtrodden. And, you know, I was just very, very overwhelmed at how beautiful that was. That is really incredible. Do you get a lot of stories like that about how the shows that that were produced by Filmation had touched on people's lives? Mm-hmm. When my dad's library, Filmation's library, came out in DVD in the mid-2000s, that gave us a chance to go to PowerCon and meet hundreds of fans. And the stories of, of what the shows meant to them. I met a gal who was autistic, who came up and was telling me that as a result of she her communication skills and her ability to relate to, to other people was was really enhanced. I met um, a young man, I happened to be a gay young man, who said Shira finally presented him with a role model that he had been looking for and starving for. And so, you know, that, that cartoon meant the world to him. He touched a lot of topics. And one of those was, well, if, you know, if, if somebody is touching you in a place that you don't think is right or they're trying to make you do something you don't feel is right, mm-hmm. you know, tell your parent, tell your teacher. And we, you know, my dad, Filmation, we got a beautiful letter from a mother who, whose child finally opened up to her about what had happened as a result of watching this episode. Good, good. It can be very difficult for kids to get through the shame of something like that. And when you hear the message from something that, uh, you know, like He-Man and She-Ra, in a, in a way it releases you. It allows you to, it just sort of gives you the permission to speak up. So that is incredible. Absolutely. Absolutely, and, and yes, it, it gave those kids permission, and it, and it, and it gave them the courage. And that is something i got to tell you, for all of us at Filmation, I mean, not just my dad, I mean, all the employees, I mean, it meant the world to all, all of us that we were producing something that helped change lives in a positive way. There seems to be a deep sense of altruism. Uh, in a, in a lot of the programming, was that always something that was that was vital for the the founders of Filmation? Was that always very much in in the hearts of those that created the shows? It, it really was, you know, the advent of of that Surgeon General's report and the the need or the requirement of the networks to finally buy something from producers that had had some some you know pro social values, some substantive values, and that. That really opened my dad. Um, we got, you know, t- tremendous letters from from viewers of Fat Albert, and that, and he really got a firsthand look at how we're affecting that. And of course, very close with all the writers. You know, everybody's you know communicating and, and sharing those letters. So that opened his eyes, and he never looked back. And I'm, I appreciate that so much. I know that uh, that you mentioned earlier that it was to the chagrin of some, but you know what? For for those of us that grew up on those shows, we appreciate it a great deal. So thank you. I'm delighted to hear that, Alex. Thank you. You're welcome. And you know, I wanted to see. Um, I heard you say before that you always want to create an environment of fun when you direct, and that that's where the magic yes. happens. Oh my God, meeting you in person, I absolutely believe that your your enthusiasm is contagious. Uh, what was it that shaped your philosophy as a as a director? Oh, that's that's my pleasure, and and you know what? It's feeding off of the energy of whether it's the actors, you know, whether it's the fans, people like you, you know, you bring so much to the to the table, and and it just it makes me excited. So, um, and I know that it felt the same way for my dad as well. You know, I'd heard that uh, that you preferred when voice directing to have everybody in the same room 
uh, as an ensemble cast instead of recording in disparate booths at different times. How was that for you? Well, that's that was super fun. I mean, there is nothing like the give and take of you know an ensemble cast and and. In general, these folks, you know, worked together for years over many different projects. So there was a, a real wonderful spirit that was, you know, that was created. I mean, when you start dealing with, you know, the, the more famous folks, when Filmation got into doing some of its fully animated features, and we had to bring in the stars separately because it was just the nature of the beast. But in, in the television stuff, was very, we were very able to get our ensemble cast together. And, and you know, they, they feed off of each other, and, and, and then they feed off of me. And, and, and there was just a sort of a, a wonderful spirit of give and take. And, and I will also share that the actors were very excited to work on programs that had some pro-social values that were more than just, you know, slam bam. I, you know, I think it's the, it's the energy of everybody and the feeling that we're really doing something good here. And that's so good to hear that the, that the actors would be with you on that journey. Yes, absolutely. I've heard you say before, too, that Hal Sutherland really mentored you in the art of animation and that he's also spoken about what a great director you are because of your understanding of the process. Can you tell me about the relationship between you two and what he taught you? Hal was like a second father. Um, you know, I obviously grew up with him my whole life. You know, I mean, he was around in my dad's life before I was. So there you have it. <laughs> uh, the summer of my 19th year, I worked at Filmation Animation and um, directly under Hal and asked him to teach me some of the art of directing animation versus directing voiceovers. Um, literally working, you know, the frame by frame sort of thing with, with directing the pictures. And that was very, very exciting. He was really gifted at that and he was such a wonderful mentor. It gave, gave me a much deeper understanding of the tediousness of the process. <laughs> I mean, it's, an, it's an incredibly difficult process. And, you know, and in the old days when things were done on cells and there is, you know, you might stack them, you know, 10, 20 deep in order to make, you know, motions and backgrounds and things. Just keeping track physically of all that material was mind blowing. So um, I, I was always astonished that a picture ever really got done, let alone in that very hurried schedule that we had to do them. He just was a, a very gifted man who was a very loving man. And I, I just really can't say enough about my, my love of Hal. And as a matter of fact, you know, he was a wonderful painter. I don't know if you were aware. Oh, no, but, I actually, uh, I wasn't. Tell me about that. His genre of, his favorite genre was Western. He liked to do all sorts of cowboy scenes and things like that, even though um, he was from Boston or back east somewhere. I, I don't know where he became such a cowboy kind of guy. He really had a, a tremendous gift of, of, of painting. And uh, I bugged him by the time, after I worked for him that when I was 19, I started bugging him that I wanted him to paint a portrait of me that I would have. Did he do it? Because nothing... And, and he did. Oh my God! It is, it is really is really wonderful. He he came over to um, our house. He took some pictures of me, and 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 I figured I was going to wind up, you know, riding a horse somewhere, <laughs> you know, and see. And he actually, when I when he gave me the painting, he had painted me as a mermaid. That's awesome. Are you serious? I am completely serious, and it was very apropos because I'm I'm very much a water baby. I'm very much a woman of the ocean, and that he saw that and and knew that that it was better to put me in the ocean than it was on top of a horse um, was really amazing. So it, it's one of those pieces I really treasure. I'm so grateful he did that for me because I have it for for the rest of my life. I have his love and painting. I. We'll spill the beans a little bit about the picture because um, I am a mermaid in it, and mermaids are traditionally topless. And the, the very funny thing about that is I had just come back from climbing in the Himalayas. 
Um, this oh, was wow. in, in eight, this was in eighty seven, and um, I'm I'm a pretty wild and crazy kind of gal. We were heading for a, a peak that was over twenty thousand feet, but um, we had some terrible terrible weather came through the Himalayas um, and and just dumped like twenty feet of snow, and we we couldn't oh. get all the way up there. But we we got we got to this this one point the, where um, we camped at eighteen thousand feet. The next day, the guy said, "You know, we can take you up close to you know twenty thousand feet. Whoever wants to just sort of do a day hike up there." And when we got up to this this point, um, we could see over the, the the nearest mountain ridge was Everest poking up, and it was just spectacular to see Mount Everest. The sky was absolutely sunny and gorgeous, and I turned to my my colleagues and my my fellow climbers and the Sherpa, and I said, "Do you mind terribly if I bare my soul, bare my breasts to the sky and to the world here?" I I just took off my top and I'm just you know bearing my soul, and and then then the guys are starting getting kind of silly with me, and they're like, "Here, hold this." screen so we can take pictures and it'll be really funny and you know so I'm having them do that and and I was telling Hal about this and Hal said geez do you think you could send those pictures I'm like well sure Hal I mean I, I, I I'm not ashamed and it turned out when he gave me the painting um, he said I needed to know what color your nipples were <laughs> so this so this picture gave, gave him the color of my nipples. So the color is even right on my nipples. You know, if I, so, if you don't mind my asking, had you had you done mountain climbing much before that, or was that the first time that you jumped into it? This was actually an alumni course. I don't know if you're familiar with the organization called Outward Bound. But no, they actually. Are a, I can't say enough about the organization. They were created in World War II in England to help military guys team learn to do teamwork. And then it, it, it developed, and there's schools all over the world, and there's many schools in this country. One of the, the, the biggest ones is Colorado Outward Bound School, and that was offering this course to go to the Himalayas. I had done my first Outward Bound course, um, a Hawaii Bound course, before I started college college in 1978. You all know how old I am now. <laughs> um, and really got hooked on it. That In that course, I climbed Mauna Loa, which is uh, 14,000 feet. Oh, wow. I did a, I did a sea school. And, uh, they had one called in Hurricane Island off the coast of Maine. And, and I, I did that in 83. And so I became uh, an alumni of the Outward Bound School, and when they started this going to the Himalayas, um, I, I said, sign me up, because I, I really trusted the organization, and I had a dream of sorts, I, I mean, sort of a, a waking, dreaming dream, not just like, oh, I dream, I'll do this, but I had this, this sense that I had to make it to the Himalayas before I was 30. And um, this course came up in 1997, and um, and it changed my life. And going on this this expedition was really an amazing, amazing journey. Shortly after that, they did this alumni series. Uh, they were going to do this the summit series and climb each of the tallest peaks on each continent. I went to Africa and climbed Kilimanjaro. Oh my I god! Went, I went to what was then. Soviet Georgia, um, and in, in part of Russia, and right during Perestroika and the wall sort of coming down and everything changing, and climb Mount Elbrus, which most people don't realize is the tallest mountain in Europe at over 19,000 feet. Most people think it's Mont Blanc, but uh, the Mount Elbrus is on, in the Caucasus Range, which is separates Asia Minor from the European continent. And um, and then I went on to uh, climb Aconcagua, which is the tallest mountain at over 23,000 feet in both the western and southern hemispheres. So I, I've done a lot of mountaineering uh, in my younger days, 
with Outward Bound. And anybody who's listening, I can't recommend it highly enough. My dad thought I was crazy. He didn't want to hear about it. You know, um, <laughs> he just thought I was an absolute loon. My mom was the daredevil, daredevil crazy lady. Really? And I came after her. But yes. Well, it was my mom, and my dad would be the first to say this, that without her, he would never have become the success that he was because she was willing to take risks. And it's easy because my mom grew up. She was the daughter of a doctor, and they had a nice, you know, upper middle class, you know, lifestyle. She wasn't worried about things. Whereas my dad was, excuse me, a poor Jew who grew up in Pittsburgh. And for him, and when he went to school the first day in kindergarten, he didn't even speak English. So he came from a place of just get me some security. And I was like, let's just go for it, baby. So, so she, she really gave him the courage to, to take the risks that created filmation. She was a wild and crazy lady in, in, in sort of... Uh, in, in taking risks like my dad, she, no, I, I was the extreme athlete. I, my, I got my athletic ability from my mom. My dad was really kind of a klutz, um, but she didn't really follow through with a lot of stuff. I, I was the adventurer, the super duper adventurer, which she completely supported, which was very important. So, um, but I, I was the wild and, and, and crazy you know, athletes of, of the Shimer family. That is awesome. And if you don't mind my asking, too, you mentioned earlier that you're a big water baby, that you're really in love with the water. What is it that you love to do? My mom threw me in a swimming pool when I was three, and I, I learned to swim. I've been, you know, swimming ever since. Um, I got my diving license, scuba diving license, when I was 15, the only one in the family to do that. I did a... Uh, uh, a, a summer at Stanford University's uh, Hopkins Marine Station. I went to Stanford oh. and graduate. And I, I did a, a you know a, a, a summer there. Hopkins Marine Station now is right next to the Monterey Aquarium. When I was going there, there was no Monterey Aquarium, mm. and you know spent three mm. months underwater. You know scuba diving my tushy off. I mentioned briefly that Outward Bound Sea School that I went to in the coast of Maine, where we spent, you know, four weeks on a pulling boat, which is basically 30 feet long, and they stuck a mast in it, and, and we would literally sleep on the boat at night by putting the oars across the fort and, and, and sleeping on the oars oh at night. Uh, done some really rigorous things, um, really like to challenge myself. And just, I just love, I'm an avid body surfer. I always thought that people who use surfboards or boogie boards, they're cheating. I feel like inserting your body in the water and becoming the board is, is a more noble occupation. What can I say? Um, I just, you know, I just love the ocean. I, I, I've been very fortunate. Um, first time I went to Hawaii, I was just six years old, and my parents were avid, avid folks of going to Hawaii, so I've done a lot of diving and just living in the water there. So, I mean, you name it. Do you um, still dive? I, I do, you, just, do you dive around here, you, too? Um, you know, actually, I'm spoiled now. I really, uh, I did get certified off of off of Catalina, some gorgeous oh, diving there. Oh, that's wonderful. It, it is, I like warmer water to Diving now, so I really haven't been in cold water diving um, for for several decades. But I still do dive um, when I get the opportunities. I, I I love it, and I just you know I I also am a you know avid swimmer. I like to swim coastlines, and you know I'll go swim for a mile or two, be gone for a couple of hours, drive my partner absolutely nuts. Um, you know, but what can I say? I'm a crazy lady in the water. <laughs> There was something that you've stated previously. You said, uh, "You know, I'm glad to show girls what they should that they should aim for what they want to be, and not fall into dated ideas about what a woman should be." And the the writer's bible for the show just said flat out, "We are empowering women." Uh, it seemed like 
the journey of Adora uh, could also be seen as metaphor for the struggle of feminism, but it's still 100% entertaining and appealing to kids. Was it difficult to, to find that balance? You know, we, we had a lot of uh, practice starting back. I go back to Fat Albert. I'm, you know, I'm sorry about, you know, who it's associated with, but, um, you know, learning to integrate entertainment with responsible pro-social messages and making it fun. So there was, there was a history of decades of, of at least, you know, 15 years uh, of that before He-Man came about. So it, it wasn't hard. It was what we did and what we liked to do. Certainly what my, my dad was very important to him and to, to Arthur Nadell, who was the head, head of the writers, wonderful, wonderful man who um, actually started working for Filmation as a live action director. But in any case, it, it was all, it, it was second nature. It was what we were meant to do. So, no, it wasn't difficult good, at all. Good, good. In, inside of the world of the show, uh, there was one theme that was really smart. And it, there, no, nobody ever really made a big deal of it in the, in the world of the show, but I felt as though it was important. You've got the Great Rebellion that's a matriarchy that's being run by Queen Angela, and she's the single mother of a mixed-race child. Yeah, that concept is ahead of its time even today. Whose idea was that? I I think that that was probably my dad. My dad was was into breaking down stereotypes and barriers, and you know, like I said, he grew up you know in a poor black community in Pittsburgh in the ghetto. Um, you know, he saw a lot of a lot of of, you know, hard luck things in his life. And, um, and, and he really wanted to make it all okay. It's okay if you're a mixed race kid from a single mom. Yeah. You know, you yeah. too can have the power. It, you know, I, I hate to keep trumpeting my dad, but he really was an amazing human being. And it really was important to him to, to speak to to speak for and to all young people. Well, you know, you you never and have to great. you never have to apologize uh, for really championing his work because it's it's admirable. Uh, so you don't have to apologize. Well, thank you. Also, the the Great Rebellion, because you've got this colorful, diverse band of outsiders that are really struggling for their place in the world. Uh, I think that that really speaks to what you just mentioned, giving a, a voice to those who feel like they've been put down and held down, and that it also feels symbolic of the LGBT community, uh, that the community has always uh, gravitated strongly towards the show. What are, what are your thoughts on that? Well, one of the things that I will say is Filmation was full of homosexuals. So, so starting from the sheer fact of the makeup of, of the artists, it, it, it made a lot of sense that, that we would have a product that is reflective of being so wide open and accepting people who, for who they are. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and, 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 it, and, the, and the folks, they love to, to, to work on it. They, you know, there was all sorts of, of jokes and, and stuff that they were doing behind the scenes with the each other, whether, you know, they're dressing up bow and drag or, you know, different, you know, making fun jokes and things like that. And, and it, it just, it was okay. I mean, you know, Filmation wouldn't have been the brilliant studio it was without all those wonderful homosexuals running around. And it's really funny because even, even today, um, my, my honey, my, my wife, it always sounds so weird to say wife, um, she has a dear friend who uh, is director, uh, a cultural director of the um, uh, gay, the gay and lesbian LGBT, the Los Angeles yeah, Gay Center, yeah. the largest, largest in the world. His name is John Imperato. Shout out to him. He's just a wonderful, wonderful human being. But I bring him up. Because one of the new folks who are working at the center, um, uh, her name is Alexis, and she is just a huge fan of She-Ra. And when she learned from John, her boss, 
that he was good friends with with Erica Scheimer. Um, she was just like, oh my god, oh my god. <laughs> um, her her license plate is even She-Ra. That's as a awesome. I, I I signed a little autograph and wrote her a note and stuff, and and she was just over over the the moon about it and as a matter of fact if, if anybody are, is interested um, she wrote Don this beautiful thank you letter and if you go to my dad's Facebook page Lou Scheimer's Facebook page my darling honey over here she just posted that letter the the other day on his Facebook page so you all can read that beautiful beautiful letter which I, I gotta tell you it brought tears to my eyes so you know Shira lives on in the young people today and it's it so maybe maybe you know we have been have an effect on American culture. Certainly, I think we've touched a lot of gay young people. Oh, absolutely, and me, absolutely. And thank you for bringing up Amy. Uh, I I wanted to see how long have you two been together? Um, actually, uh, we got together in two thousand and three. Mm -hmm. She moved in. We started living together in two thousand and four. And uh, the Supreme Court caught us up with us, so by 2014 we could get married. And how was it that uh, that you two met? Um, well, uh, interestingly enough, um, one of the 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 things that I am is a songwriter and singer, mm -hmm. and as well as a photographer. And I uh, this is you know back in 1998, I had a Funky scuzzy chain, and for all of you who don't use weren't using Apple way back in the '90s, there was a thing called a scuzzy chain, and it's how your computer had to be hooked up so that all the devices could talk to each other. And I needed some help with that, and I called up a computer store nearby and asked if they had somebody they could recommend who could come help me at home with my computer setup because bringing it into the into the the shop wasn't what was necessary. I needed somebody. And it turned out like literally the day before she had dropped off a business card at, at this place. And um, and he said, oh, geez, I've got the name of this this, this gal, uh, Amy Rosenberg. You know, <laughs> here's her number. And I hung up the phone. And I thought, gosh, isn't that cool? A woman. I'm so psyched. Uh, you know, because I figured, you know, some guy's going to come over. And she came over and she fixed my scuzzy chain. Um, I was able to scan and do some of my photography stuff, and when I closed the door and she left, and I, I just said to myself, why can't I meet somebody like her? <laughs> and about six months later, I, I and in the meantime, I had uh, gotten involved with a, a, a crazy gal who uh, had computer problems, and I said, I've got a perfect gal to come over and work on that and I think you'll really like her and um, and when she met Amy she really liked her and, and before you knew it we were all gonna we were all on double dates because Amy was in a relationship with another woman at that point so um, you know it was one of those things that you know our friendship grew and her relationship was was not growing and mm. You know, the last thing in the world I ever, I, I never had any intention of breaking anybody up. And I, I didn't because I, I wouldn't hear of it. But things didn't work out with what was going on with her relationship. And we had started playing music together by that point. She'd come over after her Tai Chi class on Saturdays. And we'd work in the studio and I'd be playing guitar and she'd be playing piano. And, and we just got closer and closer and and you know uh, and and then it turned out that we needed that that Lucia filmation had closed and Lou Scheimer productions um, was was sort of perking along but we needed uh, somebody else to work there the the person who was handling the, the desks and 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 stuff um, we had to let that person go and Amy came in and she was the last employee of Lou Scheimer Productions and then, you know, became my wife. And I, I, I've got to tell you, my dad was so excited to have a Jewish daughter. <laughs> he, he, he would tell it everybody, I've got a Jewish daughter-in-law. He was so excited. 
So, you know, it just was one of those kismet kind of things. And, um, and both, both my folks dearly love Amy. And, 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 of course, she loved my dad every bit as much as my dad loved her and, um, and, and made a promise to him that she would, you know, run his website. But, of course, Facebook came into being and that sort of, you know, usurped websites. So, you know, she's honoring that promise and, you know, devoted so much time and energy to the fans of, of Filmation and Lou Scheimer and, and sharing with you all sorts of these, these you know, pictures that are, you know, 50, 40 odd years old and that nobody's ever seen. So it's, it's, um, it's an honor for her, I, I would say, is, is fair to say, and, and, and a great joy to, to, to keep my dad's legacy alive. Tell me about... Tell me about both of your music. That she's a pianist. I I only knew that um that you had written and sang you know a bit, but I I didn't know that you play the guitar. What do you love? Tell me about it. Well, um, first of all, she's an incredible musician, incredible pianist, and and a fantastic singer. Um, I I you know hey, what can I say? You know, I think our blend of voices is is really. Um, is, is wonderful. I so I enjoy listening to us. That's all I can say. I don't know about the rest of the world, and and I haven't even tried. She was a she was a big star on campus of Sarah Lawrence, um, where she uh, wrote a musical and produced it and sang it, and you know did 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 the whole nine yards. Really, really gifted. Whereas I sort of kind of backed my way into like picking up a guitar when I was you know. Uh, uh, 12 years old and, and, and writing my first song um, and just uh, really loving it. But um, my dad was not too keen on the music business and did not want me to go into it, mm. even though I really wanted mm. to. I did not want to go against his wishes. I wanted to be the good daughter, so I, I gave up pursuing music as a career. Career, but when I started working at Filmation, he threw music things my way. Um, of course, I did the I Have the Power music video. Mm -hmm. I wrote and sang that song. You know, I did uh, Brave Star, uh, main title. I did oh, you the did that? Very nice. I was going to ask you about that. So you did the main yes. title for Brave Star. Uh, well, I worked with Frank Becker. Um, I, I wrote the theme for the Ghostbusters, our animated the original Ghostbusters, um, uh, you know, I, I did the, the Christmas song in the He-Man special, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I, I did a, a lot of that. I would never really um, played with anybody. I, I'm not, I'm one of those people, I picked up a guitar and started playing and just sort of found my way. And so when Amy and I came together and she used to come over after her Tai Chi, it was the first time that, like, I pulled out my guitar and she, and she was playing the keyboard that I had and that I ever played with anybody. So, you know, we spent, you know, was it a, the last Was it a comfortable of, fit you know, right off the bat? Yes, it was. Oh, it, it cool. Was. I mean, heck, I think the first thing we played together is she had this rickety um, ukulele and then... <laughs> And, and, you know, we got together and we're, you know, jamming on that. I'm sure it sounded absolutely horrendous. But we had a musical affinity, and, and, and I wasn't afraid to make a fool of myself in front of her. Um, usually I've always been very kind of, you know, I go play by myself, play my music so that I'm not inflicting it on anybody else. And oh she my gave gosh. me the freedom. <laughs> so, you shouldn't, so it you wanted, shouldn't be embarrassed about it. I, I, you know what can I say? It's just it's just my way. You know, well, but, I, no, I, I, I I do understand too because it's uh, you know with Dusty he's uh, he's a director and he's a writer and I am so intimidated whenever he's in the room and I'm trying to put something together or perform that it, you know it's I don't even know how to explain it but because you because I care so much about him and his opinion and I don't want to you know I don't want to look stupid or let him down that it's even more difficult uh, it feels it, so I understand completely well we've been completely vulnerable with each other so it's like you know what I, you know I don't care if I squeak or if I play in a wrong note or 
you know, um, I've just tried to raise my guitar playing to to the level of, of her piano playing. I, I'm I'm well short of it, but um, it's always been an inspiration. And um, you know, one of these days we we hope to get to, you know something out there just because you know it's it's what we do. It's just there's been a lot of sidetracks along the way. But we, we've got an album in the making that, that, we, that we finally think of it as 10 years of Sundays because we've been working on it about that long. And, and uh, you know, so who the heck knows? But but it, it's just glue for our love, and we'll, we do it anyhow that is because it's, it's an intimacy. I, I, I'm with you. I agree. I think it's pretty darn incredible, too. It's, it's an intimacy that I never um, could have dreamt of sharing with somebody. So... It's pretty amazing, and and my dad's like, just do it, girl. <laughs> if you don't mind my asking, too, what uh, what composers does she really love? What does she love to perform, and what does she love to listen to? Well, she's a major jazz freak. Mm. Um, she just loves jazz, and I'm talking about old jazz, sort of those classic old yummy jazz songs. Yeah, she just she just loves loves jazz and um and is you know is is, is truly very gifted you know uh, of from that era and and studied with with a wonderful gentleman um lewis alter who wrote with hammerstein and you know some of some of the greats so so that's where her love of music and and, and jazz in particular um comes from so so there you have it i mean and, you know, a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of different things that both of us like, and and of course we like each other. So <laughs> there you have it. <laughs> and you mentioned Brave Star uh, just a little while ago. I wanted to, yeah, I wanted to touch on that really briefly. Your father wanted to create a show with a native superhero as its star. What was it that compelled yes. him? How did he come up with the concept? My dad was really a huge fan of science fiction fantasy, mm -hmm. and he read all sorts of science fiction mm -hmm. fantasy. He, you know, also, you know, liked westerns, and the idea of doing sort of a futuristic western was just so appealing. There was nothing like that that was going on at the time. Having done, you know, Fat Albert, and uh, you know, my my dad also in, in other cartoons, you know, they would have different mix of ethnic group that was important because you know kids come in all sizes and shapes mm -hmm. and, and nationalities and mixes. Mm -hmm. So when it came time to do Brave Star, he thought, and, and this is my dad, I mean, um, that the idea of having a Native American Indian be the sheriff, you know, the good guy, um, just was such a perfect way to sort of put things on the their head yes. and make people look at things a little differently. And that's what my dad and, and our, our shows were always trying to strive to make people look at things a little, a little differently. You know, don't just take things what you, what, what is normal. Let's, let's make it a little off skew and it, and it might bring a lot more exactly. significance to it. So, because it, so that, because it, was, it you know, was the, because it was that element of the unexpected and because you did see, you know, a Native American face where they're painfully underrepresented, that that's something that's, that's incredible. It is very much ahead of its time, even today. I, I, I hear you. I got, it, maybe two years ago, I got a fan letter um, with a bunch of beautiful art drawings from a Native American gal living on a reservation who wrote to thank me and my dad for, for the creation of Brave Star and for her to have a role model of this Native American Indian who's the sheriff. He's not the bad guy. Yeah. He's the good guy was so significant and so meaningful to her. I actually even wrote her back. I was so touched by what she did that, you know, I, I hear you. It, 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 it was a wonderful thing to do. And, and just to get that one fan letter from one Native American Indian made it all worthwhile. It really, really was a, a, a beautiful thing. Once again, tears to my eyes. I mean, we got the best fans in the world, and they're, they're constantly making me cry with their <laughs> wonderful stories. <laughs> That is so cool. And I know that you mentioned that you were involved with the music on the show, and I've heard that you were deeply, deeply involved 
uh, with the creation and execution of the show, what, what aspects of the show were you responsible for? Well, when I came on board, literally I started at Filmation the week that He-Man aired, uh, which meant I was not part of the first season creatively of He-Man. Mm -hmm. um, I, I bring that up because at that time um, there was uh, Chaim Saban and Shuki Levy. Actually, Shuki Levy is the one who really did the music. He was was the musician and artist. You know, uh, you know what can I say? But in any case, I wanted to to change things up, up. and um, and I. I was on, on, on my dad's case to, like, let's get somebody new to do the music. And I had met this very gifted composer, uh, writer, uh, and he also was a script writer and, and prose writer as well. Um, and I, his name is Frank Becker, and I wanted to have him do the music. Sure enough, my dad sort of was very impressed with what Frank could do. And, and Frank was really, he was one of those oven guard musician types who was living in Japan, you know, working with Rauschenberg and the paintings and, you know, John Cage and, and experimental music. Very, very um, highbrow kind of guy, but could just dig in the trenches, loved classical music. And, you know, he could create incredible things, you know, the very beginning of synthesizers and, and sampling and all that stuff. And so we hired Frank Becker to do music, and he, I think, he started on with Brave Star, where he did the Library of Music, and I worked with Frank. I wrote the the lyrics or the words for the the He Man main title, and he did you know beautiful you know orchestration, and and you know he did all the music for for all of of, of Brave Star. You know I I worked with him, and you know came in and did the singing, you know. The little bit of background singing that was that was necessary for for Brave Star, and there and there were some songs that were in the bodies of the show, and we did those together. Um, you know, and wherever I could get my fingers involved with with either you know the writing words or or coming up with a tune or singing, I, I certainly did get involved that way. So, I, I you know I did everything. I was not an artist with with a pencil with my hand. Sound and music and, and, and words, that, that was where my, my expression of art, and photography, so I related to images, but that's where my, my art came from. And my dad was, was very supportive. I think, well, you know, I think he kind of knew I didn't pursue a music career because of him, so he let me sort of, you know, do, get my hands really dirty with all the filmation music, which I enjoyed thoroughly. Well, you, know, you mentioned the photography just now, and you mentioned it earlier as well, and said that this was something about you that a lot of people don't know about and haven't seen. When I was nine years old, my dad started to teach me how to use a camera, mm -hmm. and pretty much I started shooting pictures. When I was at Stanford, um, I started off as a human biology major, but ended up after spending a year abroad, Stanford and Vienna, and really getting involved with art, and that's when I really made a connection with my father, going to museums and talking about painting. Um, I ended up being able to switch my major. Back then, Stanford allowed you to design your own major, mm -hmm. and basically, mm -hmm. I designed a, a multimedia major before the word multimedia existed. It was a combination of pain of painting photography, film, theater, and music, and I did a lot of uh, photography at Stanford, um, you know, love living in the dark room, you know, back back in the day when you develop negatives and print pictures, um, and, and just really, really enjoyed that. I, I sort of, I enjoy doing something that I, I myself have called organic abstracts, look, you know, finding really organic images, and, and then make and seeing different things inside of them, you know, not just like, oh, let's, you know, take a pretty picture of, of, of a person. I, you know, I've done a fair amount of nature photography, clearly, you know, having climbed a lot of mountains and, and, and stuff. So, you know, sort of that kind of breadth of, of photography. I, I just, I just love doing it all. It, it was just a really wonderful outlet. It was a great way for me and my dad to sort of have a, a a connection because growing up my dad didn't really know what to make of me because I was pretty much a math science kind of kid and my dad didn't know you know he didn't relate to math or science at all it wasn't until I went to school in Vienna and got really immersed in painting and my dad was actually a painting and design major 
and went to used to walk to school with Andy Warhol back in the day when he was at Carnegie Tech, which is now called Carnegie Mellon. So that's what connected me to my dad. The photography was the first sort of connection we had, and then it wasn't until you know my junior year where my dad and I our relationship just took off because. I, I could connect with him uh, from painting, and that was really exciting and wonderful. So there you have it. I, I, I'm sorry that I was just on the cusp of the computer age, because I'm sure I probably would have gotten very involved in computer science. When I was uh, started at, at Stanford, you know, a kid in the dorm was building a computer. The, the, the folks who were devising Google, you know, they were in grad school. It, it was all just underneath the surface, so I just sort of missed that and just sort of went to more, you know, the performance art kind of thing and, and some of the strange performance artists. I don't know if you've ever heard of Laurie Anderson. Yeah, I love Laurie you know, Anderson. Oh, my gosh. As a, as a photographer for the Stanford Chaparral, the, the, their, the, their, comedy, the, their comedy magazine on campus, I, I went to several Laurie Anderson concerts and actually... Oh, my God, and, stop it. Yeah, How is yeah, she live? Just fabulous. I oh. absolutely... Just absolutely fabulous. I, I just really was very inspired by her and sort of wanted to follow in those footsteps. And, of course, my dad didn't want me to go into music, and I didn't because I'm a good girl. Um, but I, I was really very, very fascinated by, by all that stuff. You know, that, that, that whole avant-garde world was, was very exciting to me. I, you know, the, the future is a blank slate. So anything is possible. I'm just getting through the, the passing of my father, looking at his, his house is selling. You know, I, I'm just sort of coming out of the cocoon of dealing with the death of my folks. And they, they were big, big acts to follow and, and a lot of, of stuff to deal with. And so, you know... Who knows what my future will hold in terms of the artistic endeavors that I that Amy and I get involved with? A anything is possible, and um, I, I hope to. I absolutely, indeed, hope to. You know, get something together. I, I just, I'm just now beginning to commence to think about anything like that. But you know, if ever there was a person so, that, that could not be chained or restrained. It's you. Uh, you really have conquered so much of the world, uh, academia, arts, sciences. I, I began this conversation with an admiration for you, but I, I'm ending this conversation with my mind just blown. I, I cannot wait for people to hear all of these sides of you that, that they might not have heard before. I really thank you so much for this opportunity to speak with you about a whole host of things, and and I just I think you're a terrific fellow. Well, thank and, you. And I, I'm I'm proud that you're a fan of He-Man and She-Ra and and part of the filmation family along with it. So I, I really thank you, Alex. You're 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 a special young man. I wanted to say again uh, how much I appreciate you for joining me, uh, and it's it's been an outrageous pleasure having you. Uh, to all of the people who are listening at home, thank you for listening. Uh, please like this video and subscribe to the YouTube channel. I'm Alex Pearl, and this was Beyond Borders. Good night, everyone.